before we get to the message today, I need, uh, I need a couple volunteers. I have a, any volunteers that can help me do that? Hey, Kason, come on forward. Good job, buddy. I actually need to go back by the thing. I need, well, I need a couple. That means two. Hey, Bryce, can you go back by the table back there? Kason, go back by the table. All right, very good. Actually, I can use one more. All right, Isaac, thank you. You can meet them by the table. Very good. I don't know if you were prompted to put your hand up or what. Uh, Isaac doesn't typically volunteer. Right table, right here. Whoop, shh. Look at me. Hey, step. Okay. All right. In front of you, Bryce, you should see a uh, paper that has seven names on it, or a space for seven names. You see that? Okay, I want you to pick that up and give half of it to Isaac. Half of the stack. <laughs> Lord, help. Okay, <laughs> so just so you know, coming up soon, we're having our Easter and beyond today. If you signed up, we need you here today at 3 o'clock. Today we're going we're gonna to talk about the whole thing, go over three scenes, and the next week... Uh, give you the videos for the other three scenes so you can kind of get your juices wet. It's going to be really good this year. We have some amazing things. I showed it to part of our staff last week who were helped decorate, and they're already good on the decorating. We're going to have a golf cart this year, and we're going to, the tomb scene is amazing. We're going to have a, well, I won't give it all away. It's going to be so much better than the last two years, and they, some of them were crying last week as they saw the video. So uh, Bryce and uh, L Isaac, can you pass one out per, per family, just uh, per family head? What I want you to do is we want you to take this home and, uh, and, don't worry, Casey, I'm coming to you. All right, so uh, and invite seven people. What you want to do is you want to take this home, think about it, and put your name on it, and seven people you can invite. And if you don't have seven friends, just find seven people you don't like. Because if they got saved, they would be your friends, right? If they came to know Jesus, right? They got to be your friends, right? That's, so invite them out. It's free. It's going to be great. We're going to have two performances, one at 10 a.m. and one at 6 p.m., the same show. So uh, they can come to either one. And we're going to have a great time. And if you, or go to your neighbor's house. Write down their, you might not know your neighbors. Just write down their house number. We'll, and we're going to send it in and put your personal invitation on it. And we have a beautiful postcard that has been made. It looks like this. Isn't that nice? And I know you can't see it real well from here. So, Casey, guess what you're going to do? You got it. Good job. And he's going to pass them out. And take one home, hand it to somebody. We got 500 of these. We got plenty to, to mail out. Um, but it's, it's, we want to invite people out in the morning and in the evening. This week we'll have a big uh, announcement on Facebook and Instagram and on our webpage. Uh, we'll be promoting this for the next three weeks. We believe that we want to see a lot of people get saved. I, I know, uh, kudos, uh, John. Where's John Pisarczyk? Hey, John. You already invited somebody. Awesome. That's great. You only got to put six more down, so you're good. You're, you, you know, seven minus one is six. But everybody needs to do this because you know what? This is, we're supposed to share our faith with somebody, right? So this year, last year, I kind of asked you to do it. This year, I'm saying do it. Okay, why? Because what if one of them came and got saved? You get credit for that in heaven one day. You have a crown of life in heaven. So you know what? It's, it's, it can only bless you. And, all you got, and you don't got to do anything else but give me their name and address. We'll do the rest for you. Isn't that great? So uh, we're going to be having that uh, coming up very shortly. I'm excited about what's going on. And next up, as you know, next Sunday night, we start our evening service. Uh, with uh, We still have our evening service. We're starting our online campus. This week I put out a uh, test, a test email, a test Facebook advertisement. And it's unbelievable the response we got. 2,300 people watched it. A hundred, over a hundred families have already contacted me about the time, the date, because they don't have a Pentecostal church in the neighborhood. You know, I, I, it'd be great if a hundred showed up. A hundred families, that's like two, three hundred people. You know, I'd be happy if 20 families showed up. That's about a hundred people, you know. And so this is where we're really going to be advertising. So if you know somebody, maybe you can't come. I, I was talking to Connie. Can I use you? I was, uh, what's your friend's, I forget your friend's name. Judy, thank you. Judy uh, came to our church a few, uh, about a year and a half ago, but she can't come to church because she watches her kids and her son won't let her bring her kids to church. Is that basically the gist of it? So you can't do that? And so Connie was talking about the thing, and she's excited to watch it online because she can't, and you know what? It'll be at her house, and guess who else gets to watch the show? Her kids, isn't that great? It's not at church, right? So God is doing some great things. We have some wonderful things. And you'll be getting a letter this week about that, also about the Daniel fast. By the way, it's not just vegetables and water. We, have, we, we took the whole thing out, told you what you can do. Yes, you can cook your vegetables and things like that. Uh, but I, who needs an answer from God? This is, God says we'll be smarter and stronger if we do all 10 of these days. I know some people up here today had prayer for any questions. Trust me, this, it's a great week because we're doing our Daniel fast this week. It's amazing how... This this works. We follow the word of God. Because remember, I'm not asking you to do this. God did because he wants to bless you with some amazing answers this year. All right, we're going to go on to our message today, the seven cries from the cross. And uh, I just want to review last week real quick. 
Um, last week we talked about the Roman crucifixion. How many were blessed by that? How many would want to do that? Thank you for not raising your hand. I would have to have serious counseling with you. Uh, but, you know, we only gave you just a bits and pieces of how it was an event. It wasn't just the, the thing on, on Calvary. It was the whole event together, and it was a spectacle. It was a, a play or something where people would go and, and enjoy themselves. Isn't that sick? But, you know, the neat thing I got from there when I was studying and I posted online, and we got the most hits from this last week, was this picture here. They would reuse the spikes. They wouldn't clean them off, but their blood dried on from previous people they had killed. So that means when Jesus says he took on our sins, he literally did because, you know what, there were murderers, there were rapists, there were thieves, and there were innocent people who were crucified to that cross whose blood was dried on that, on that nail they put through Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? And then we done on, we did our first cry from the cross, and John, he's, John 19, 28 says, I what? Thirst. <clears throat> you know, Jesus thirsts for souls. You know, and you know, the interesting thing about that experience was, is he was, right when he got the Calvary, he was given something to drink, right? He was given water mixed with gall, and he decided he didn't want it. Now at the end, we're going to talk about one where he did take a sip just to wet his lips to say his last thing, but he refused to drink because of the gall, and the gall was used to numb the pain. And why did they do that? For mercy? No, because the Romans wanted to see the, the, the person last longer. Boy, isn't that sick. But why didn't Jesus take the gall? Because he didn't want to have any part of him numbed. He didn't want to take away any of the suffering he was going through because he did not want to buy us at a discounted rate. He wanted to buy us at full price so no one could ever question the sacrifice he made for us. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that great? So today we're going to go to two more cries today. And the first one, and the first one today is in Luke chapter 23, 43. Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. And this narrative is about the two thieves on the cross. I need to put this down because I'm going to keep bumping it. And both of them were on the cross, and, and they're being crucified. And there probably were others there too, by the way, because they would crucify people in mass in masses, and so they get the Romans could get the most bang for their buck, for lack of a better term. And these two thieves were the ones closest to Jesus, and they were probably mocking those who were down there uh, killing them. They were probably pleading for their life, and one we know for sure was cursing just about everybody he could. Why? Because they were trying to put the blame on somebody else, saying, yeah, I'm going to get you. Boy, you're on the cross, you're about to die. That's a really tough thing to say from there. And uh, what's happening is they were up there for hours with Jesus. And then all of a sudden, what happens? One of the thieves looks at Jesus, and the light bulb goes on. And uh, what happened is, is this thief might have seen Jesus like the Roman soldier we talked about last week saw Jesus. He claimed that Jesus was the Son of God, the Roman soldier. Why? Because Jesus did not act like anybody else who died on the cross. He didn't complain. He didn't curse anybody else. He didn't blame somebody else. He didn't even claim to be innocent himself. All he did was speak seven words of love that pierces our souls to today. And it pierced his soul. And the thief had to be on the cross for hours with him. What happened? He turns to Jesus and the light bulb goes on. Maybe this guy is the son of God. Now how does the thief know to make this choice? Well, first of all, all the people at the bottom of the cross were tormenting Jesus, weren't they? If you are the Son of God, call down your angels and get you off of that. Now, do you think that's the only mocking word they said to him? No, we only, if, if the whole thing was there, the Bible would be so big, we would not be able to read it. But, you know, that's just an example of what they were saying. And this guy heard that over and over and over again. All of a sudden, what happened, went on in his head? Could this guy really be the Son of God? Now, somehow he begins to focus on Jesus. Now, we talked about how terrible the crucifixion was for maximum pain, torture, and humiliation. You know, the, he was up there on the cross hanging. He was not just hanging there, hanging out. Hey, how, how, no, he's in immense pain. He, he, he is being mocked by the people down there. Everything's going in a whirlwind around him, but yet... This situation does not lead itself to someone who is going to be able to do some deep thinking. You know, he's in excruciating pain, about to die. Then all of a sudden he begins to think about who Jesus was. 
I think Jesus is living out a word here. It says in Matthew 5, 7, Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain what? Mercy. What is mercy? Undeserved favor. Someone gives you mercy because you don't deserve it. Is it possible this moment that the thief, when he began to think about who Jesus was, I think about if you're on the cross, if you, if you missed last week, get the tape of it or go online and watch it. Think about this thief. Think about what's going on in his life. At this moment in time, all the pain he's going through, wouldn't it be just like Jesus, God the Father, to grant the thief a momentary lapse from his pain so he could think about what was going on? As God saw the light bulb going on in the guy's life. Remember, time is not, nothing for God. And then what happens is once the thief thinks, he says these words. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your what? Kingdom. The thief is able to see Jesus. And he reaches out in faith. Jesus, you are who you say you are. Remember me. Isn't that great? That's the, the faith is the word remember. We know that he is sincere. Because, you know, otherwise he would just be mocking. And, now, you know, he's not doing that anymore. Because he says, remember me, Lord. He's pleading with them. What's he doing? He's asking for what? Mercy. He's asking for forgiveness. He's asking, hey, if you're the real deal, I'm telling you right now, I believe in you. And Jesus responds what he said today. But what's the first word Jesus says to the guy? He says the word, assuredly. That is a comforting word. Because, see, we can be sure of our salvation. Why? Because we say the prayer? No, that's not why you're assured. Because the Bible says so? Well, that, that's, yeah, that's good. God keeps his promise. But here's how we're assured. Here's what happens. When you truly ask God into your heart and give your whole life over to the Lord, you begin a what? A relationship with him. Remember, we don't talk about religion. We talk about relationship. At that moment, I can imagine Jesus, even throughout all the pain that he was going through, looked upon that guy. He could have said, ah, forget about you. But he doesn't. What's he say? Assuredly, today you'll be with me in paradise. Imagine the look that was probably on Jesus' face as he looked at the thief. Imagine how the thief must have felt when Jesus said that to him. Because as soon as the thief reached out, Jesus reached back and they made a connection. They made a relationship. Yeah, the thief was still going to die on the cross, but now he knew for sure he was going to be in heaven. Isn't that amazing? I would like to have seen that God moment that happened right there and then. And how do we know it's a God moment? Because, well, there was another thief out there, right? Remember him? When the first thief starts the conversation, what begins to happen? The other thief begins to mock Jesus even more, right? Tells the other thief, be quiet, what are you doing? This guy. And they have this conversation that leads to finally the first thief asking Jesus to forgive him. But what about the second thief? He's still cursing Jesus, right? But he's still alive, isn't he? We don't know much what happened the rest of the way. What if the thief and Jesus, when they had this moment, Jesus turns his head towards the other thief and looks on him in love? You know what? Everybody has a chance to come to know Jesus. We don't know the end of the story there. I have no idea what happened. Most probably the other thief didn't come to Jesus, but we don't know that for sure. But I want to let you know that Jesus cared just, amount, just as much about the thief on this side as he did about the thief on that side. And the reason why is because this, because everybody, everyone was a thief at some point in their life. Everybody has been a thief. Now, I'm not talking about going to the grocery store and picking out a candy bar and hiding and taking it out. Not that I ever did anything like that. I tried, then I got mom and dad kind of, well, you, you can go from there. <clears throat> we were all kids, we all did things, like, but here's what we're all guilty of. We're guilty of taking a life that God gave us and ripping it from his love by sinning. We stole our life. We stole what God created us to be from him by choosing to take our life away from him by choosing to sin. You know, God created each and every one of you to be a masterpiece. He created you to do awesome things with the Lord. The devil does not want that in your life. But it all comes down to what? Choices, right? God created you for him so you could do some amazing things. 
And that's why, you know what? Jesus died for every single one of us. To bring us back to him, to change your life. That's the one thing I remember. If you become a Christian, your life will change because God wants to make you better than you were before. If you become a Christian and your life doesn't change, you got to wonder what's going on. you got to give your whole life to the Lord because he wants to make you the way he always wanted you to be. Isn't that great? Amen. And here's the other thing you got to realize is this story shows us that no one is beyond God's mercy. These two thieves condemned to die by mankind. If they would not have met Jesus, they both would have gone to hell. We know for sure the one, boy, what, what, what an amazing thing, at the last moment of his life, got to experience God's mercy. I'm just telling you, the look that had to happen, because you got to have a, you got to give your whole life to God. At that moment, they had a relationship moment on the cross where the thief knew it's going to be okay. Don't know how the other thief reacted to what Jesus did. Hope that maybe he gave his life. But here's the point. No matter what, no one is beyond God's mercy. You know, we can never look at anybody in this world as being beyond God's mercy. If you do that, you are in a dangerous place, my friend. Because here's the deal. You begin to play God. That is not your place. It is our place to what? Show love. And always look at someone how they could be if they really would change. I know some people say, well, they, they deserve to go to hell. You know what? So did you. But then someone shared the life-changing knowledge of Jesus Christ with you. We have no right to keep that from anybody. So now we go on to the second one today. It's John 19, 26, and 27. It says, woman, behold your son. And then he says to John, behold your mother. Now, Jesus, once again, he's in pain and agony, right? And there he sees his mom at the crucifixion. Now, if you read through the New Testament, you find out that Jesus had brothers and sisters. Guess what? They weren't there. Why weren't they there? I'll tell you why. You find it in Mark where you talk about how they think he was crazy and that, that they were ashamed of him. Because, you know, what? the crucifixion wasn't just designed for the victim. It was designed to also humiliate and put torture and pain on the family. Why? Because what, what was the number one job of the crucifixion? Was what? To produce social conformity. So about Mary, we need to get into her mind to really grasp what this story, what this statement means. First of all, you've got to realize that Mary was a zealot. Now the zealots were, for lack of a better term, a political party. And they decided, they thought they could bring in the kingdom of God by force, by forcing God's hand. Judas Iscariot, who crucified, who betrayed Jesus, didn't crucify him, big part of it, was a zealot. He thought that if he put Jesus in a position to be killed, God would have to come down and save him because the zealots thought Jesus would come back and set up the kingdom on earth, defeat the Romans, and make Israel rich and powerful here on earth. They did not see the whole big picture. Mary was one of the zealots. And then she was a zealot. And also remember when the angel came and said, Behold, you're going to have, look, the person's going to take away what? The sins of the world. You're going to call him Jesus because he'll take away the sins of the world. So he, she knows this about Jesus. The problem with the zealots were they wanted God to do it their way, not God's way. Does that happen a lot today where people want God to do things their way, not God's way? It gets people confused, don't they? You know, I believe God will do many things for us, but you know what? He has a better plan than we do. We trust him, but it always works out. The problem is when we tell God, well, if you don't do it this way, God, I'm not going to believe in you. Well, that's a really dumb statement to make. Yeah, I should laugh at that. Second of all, we know that, that at one point Mary saw Jesus preaching, and she sent the brothers in, like I just talked to you about, to tell them to stop because she thought he was out of his mind. Translation today, he was crazy. Because he was bringing things against him that this, this is not what the Messiah would do. This is not what a conquering king would do. And she was what? Confused about Jesus' message. And then we also know from the early records of the early church that Mary did not become a Christian, meaning did not believe who Jesus really was, did not get it until after he was rose from the dead. We also know that because the disciples didn't get it either. It says many times in the scriptures that we did not understand this until after he was raised from the dead. If you read Mark, John chapter 20, 
When Jesus rises from the dead, he appears to the disciples, and they believe only after they see the holes in the hands and the, and the, and the piercing in the side. And the funny thing is, people make fun of Thomas. They did the same thing. A few verses later, you read about doubting Thomas. The, the, all the disciples and all the people with them did the same thing a couple of verses earlier. Because his story was almost too unbelievable. That's what I hear today from a lot of people. The story of Jesus is just absolutely unbelievable. You know what it is if it's just a story. And that's why we don't believe in religion. We believe in relationship because you have a relationship with Jesus. You're going to have people who come, when you share your faith, they're going to have questions about Jesus. But when they give their life over to God and take that step of faith and they begin to have a relationship, you know what happens to have a relationship? You get to ask the questions you always wanted to ask. And he begins to respond to you. Isn't that great? Bottom line, Mary was a very confused, sad person. And she also might have been a tad bit ashamed. Because remember, the crucifixion was what? Designed to humiliate not only the person being crucified, but their family. I bet you people were mocking. People who came to these trials not only mocked the person on the cross, but they mocked their family. Why the brothers and sisters didn't show up. So Mary's standing there, and what do you think people were saying to her? Hey, look at your son. He claims to be the son of God. Look at him now. We're going to kill him. Look at your son. See, we, we knew he was illegitimate. Remember, we talked to Christmas years ago when people thought he was illegitimate because Joseph was going to put her away because the Holy Spirit came inside of her. But everybody in the world didn't know that. They thought she, that Jesus was what? Illegitimate, right? Look at, see, we told you, your son's cursed. What kind of mother are you? Let him get, oh, ever, anybody heard that one before? To think the things you hear today. They're nothing new under the sun, folks. And they probably used some curse words. No, I, I'm, I, I'm lying. They did use some curse words. What's this? They were the, most people that came to the crucifixion were there to enjoy what was going on. And because they were miserable and they enjoyed making someone else be more miserable, weren't they? And then think about Mary while she's there. She's already confused about her son. She's sad that he's dying. And now everybody's picking on her. I could see Mary this going through her mind, if not out loud. Look at my life. My husband died. I had this child who said he was going to save the world, and now he's dying in front of me. I'm poor. I'm a widow. You said you'd come and rule the world, and look at this. How are you going to rule the world being like this? You're supposed to bring Israel to the top. It's not going to happen because you're going to die. People still make fun of me about you because of the way you were born. I mean, think of all these things going through her head. You went then, all of a sudden, you turn 30, and you leave me and go off and do ministry. I come to you, and one day you even say, who was my mother? Who was my brothers? He had a statement about that once. What's Mary come to? My life is ruined because of you, son. You're a fraud. You got to remember, Mary was confused, sad. At some point, she had to be a little bit ashamed because she was a zealot. She didn't get it. Doesn't that sound like most of the world today about Jesus? They're one of those three states, aren't they? Confused about him, ashamed about him, or saddened about him. Yet Jesus looks at Mary, looks down at her. He did not mean to her. He knows what's going on. He's God, right? But he says to John, look at your mother. Look at, look at her. She's now your mother. I want you to take care of her. And why did he say that to John? Because if his brothers or sisters would have been there, he might have said to them, take care of her. But they weren't there. He said to John because he knew something amazing was about to happen. They were going to be part of a new family, a spiritual family. See, Jesus took care of mom. And you know what? He didn't have any conditions on mom. He didn't care what mom thought about him at that moment in time. He did the duty of a family member. Because what you got to remember is God is all about, what's our word? Family. And we need to take care of our family the way that God said so. Here at the church, our concept is family. And why is that? Because in the Bible it says if you come to Jesus, you give, you're given the right to be called the children of God. So many times he says, little children, call out to me, daddy, daddy, Abba, father. And then you read the New Testament how when they greet one another, they call themselves what? Brothers and sisters. These are not words that's made out of air. We become part of an amazing new family. Yes, we still have our nuclear family, but we also have our church family, and we should treat both the same. 
Well, let me rephrase it. We should treat those the same the way God wants. Sometimes people treat their family, and well, you're, you're laughing. You got the idea. <clears throat> the question is, are we part of an amazing family? Uh, Tim Huber, on Monday night, we had our elders meeting, and you said, uh, the church seems to be becoming more like a family, right? Remember saying that? And that's great. We better be good at it. We better start be giving towards that. Because here's the deal. The church cannot be a group of individual families that just come together once a week. When you come in this room, you're no longer individual families or individuals per se. You're part of the family of God. A family unit cannot function if they are not all together part of the family. If someone tries to be an individual, you usually what? What's it do? Pairs the family apart, right? They go their own way. Doesn't mean you can't have your own thoughts and all that. We, we bring them all together into one unit to make the family what? Better. When one doesn't care about the family, it affects the whole family, doesn't it? In either the nuclear family or the church family. And so we need to do what God asks us to do. And so as family members, we're supposed to do something for each other. Three things the scripture says. The first thing we're supposed to do is this. We're supposed to provide for one another. Now, before you read into this, there are three stages of each of these. There are people who need to be provided for, there are people who are providing, and there are people teaching how to provide. Okay? Now, there's a rub to both of those because some people go, I hear these two statements all the time. I'm going to begin with the first one. First of all, we need to, we need to pr provide for each other no matter what is going on because that's what family is supposed to do. The Bible says before you go ask anybody else for help, ask your family. They're supposed to be there for you. Now, here's the thing I hear all the time. My church or my family won't help me. They won't give me what I need, or sometimes that's translated, what I want. You know, we live in a world that wants, wants more and more and more and more and more. Now, there will be some times where we need to step up to the plate and provide for a need for the family, and we have done that many times. But providing for need is not always doling out food or cash or, or assistance. Another way to provide for the family is this, is allowing them to learn how to solve their problems on their own and say the word no. It's okay to say no. But here's the rub. You can't say no like this. Well, I don't want to help them because of who they are, what they did. They got themselves in their, this own mess. I, I, it's not going to help them because they should have known better. If that's your attitude, you're not part of the family. Because family helps family no matter what. What if God did that to us? Because how many times do we get saved and then we go to God and we do something wrong? And what's, what if God said that's your problem? Imagine where we would be. Jesus put no conditions, neither can we. You can say no, but you have to have the attitude that you're, what you're doing, why you're saying no, is intended to make them better themselves. And how do you do that? You say no, but then you also at a distance, remain there to help them if they fail. So many times we do this, and we'll, we'll show them what to do, and then they fail, and we'll, oops, they fail, they deserve to fail. They don't get the picture yet. You know, sometimes it takes somebody two, three, four, ten times to get it right. You know, what we got to see is what God wants to do, to try better, right? But so many times as humans, we give up after the first try, don't we? See, they're not worth me helping them. Jesus doesn't do that. But here's the deal. You need to stay in the background and be there for them. You know, a good parent will let their child, when they get old enough as an adult, to go out into the world, right? But, and let them do their own thing. But if they fail, they're kind of in the background just in case they have someone to fall back on. That's the way we need to be towards one another in family. Providing is two ways. Helping with the need, but sometimes, because if you always just help with the need, you create an entitled people, Right? Somebody you got to teach them how to do that. You know, and some of you have come to me for needs, and then sometimes I'll say, no, but why? Because I want to help you get better. Why well, we did the choices thing? And put it together and see how God can bless you doing that. The other thing, and, and the, the rub is, how do you know when to hand out and when to hold back? Well, it was a wonderful verse. James 1.5 says this, that if you lack wisdom, ask him who does not withhold anything, but gives liberally to all those who ask, which means he will give you the answer. Remember our, our decision process? Find, define the thing, talk to God, blah, and hey, if you don't know what to do, ask God. We have a relationship with him. He's not up there. He's right here. The next thing a family needs to do for one another is they need to fight for each other. I didn't say fight each other. That happens a lot in families and in churches. But you need to fight for each other. 
We need to rise up and defend our own. Never let someone come in and attack one of our own. Never let the devil do that. You know, we have the power to kick him out. Let's do that on a more of a basis, right? We should, in the name of Jesus Christ, the demons will flee. We should start using his name a lot more. On uh, Thursday, I pray, every Thursday, I pray over everybody in the church. I walk through the pews and I pray over every one of you by name. And you know what? This week, God had me yell out something as I prayed. In the name of Jesus Christ, fill this pew and that person with the glory of God and for the glory of God. And I was doing it quietly. And then God said, what are you doing? I'll tell you, uh, here's what happened. I was over here, and I walked about five pews, and God said, nope, go back, start again. And then I, I had added a few words to it until I finally got it right. And then I got all the way to the back of this pew here, and God said, do you really mean it? Well, yeah. There's a lot of pews. I want you to shout it. So I'd come all the way back to the front. And I got all the way around, and I'm right here, and I got to about this section here, and I was tired, and I was not doing it as much. He said, ah, move back a few pews. Because you know what? God wants us to have passion. When he was on the cross, he cried these out with passion. He's looking for a passionate people. And so we need to help each other out, defend people, and, de and, and defend each other. As part of this, we need to show people how to fight. You know, there's going to be people on each stage that need to know how to do things. You're going to be able to fight, some need to teach, and some need to be protected. Because that's what we are as a family, we do that. I remember one day, I came from the bus, and this kid named Brian wanted to fight me. I went home and told my dad. I was uh, in junior high school, and it was over his sister, and said I said something to her. I said, I didn't say anything about her. And actually, I kind of liked her. Uh, but uh, um, uh, and, uh, so, so I came back, Dad said, okay, well, get up. I said, okay, I stood up, and he proceeded to hit me. Dad, why are you punching me? He says, son, I'm going to teach you how to fight. Okay, how do I do it? And he hit me again. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he tried to hit me again, I moved, he said, it's about time. <laughs> and he showed me how to, how to move and jab and all that. Now, I'm not talking about doing that to an actual physical person, folks. Uh, the next day, though, we had the fight. I didn't fight. I, I was taller, and I was able to keep him at, at arms. But, and we got to talk it all out, which was much better than, than actually fisticuffing, as I still wasn't really sure how I would do that. He was two grades higher than me. But I was taller than him. It's kind of strange. Okay. But, you know, I'm not referring to that type of fighting as a solution, but we need to teach you that to fight because, you know, we have, the Bible says in the, in the New Testament that we have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. We have the power to move mountains. We have the power to say, hey, get this fixed, and it will be fixed because you know what? God wants to do that for you and because God wants us to win. And here's the neat thing about God's family. Just because you're 70 years old and 5 years old doesn't mean that you're older or younger in the Lord. Depending on when you got saved, a five-year-old got saved at five and they're now 20, and a person who was 50 got saved and now 60, the 20-year-old's been in Christ 15 years longer than the other person, hasn't they? I want to give you a story about this girl named Lakeland Bartland. I was in Texas. She was 10 years old, and we had a Holy Spirit night at our church. And we invited all kinds of kids. We had 300 kids come. I was a kid's pastor back then. And they came to the service. And, and there was this Baptist church that showed up. Not sure why. Because all about speaking in tongues that night. That's what we were praying about. And so we went through the whole service and the whole thing, and afterwards, this lady from that church walked up to the front and said, we're leaving because we don't believe in that stuff. That's not of the Lord. And this little 10-year-old girl walked up to her and said, can I pray for you? And, the, and, the, and the, this old lady in her 50s, I, she had gray hair, and I'm guessing. I, I can't, well, I should never guess a woman's age. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but I, I'm looking at, and Lakeland goes, can I pray for you? And she begins to pray for her. And the lady falls down under the power of the Holy Spirit and starts speaking in tongues. You know what? The, church, the Baptist church stayed for the next day. We had the overnight thing. And they started asking questions. I never saw them again. I wanted to meet their pastor. He never wanted to meet me. <laughs> ah. But you know what? They got to experience the power of God. Next thing, the last thing is this. We need to be a shield for our family. The key word is what does shield mean? Shield means that sometimes we take the brunt of the attack for our family member. We are willing to step into the attack for them. You know, this happens all the time. And sometimes people say this, well, you know, I, I'm not going to defend them there. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to let them waffle out there because, you know, they, they, they get what they deserve. You know what Jesus says? He's always a shield for us, right? 
He's a rock and a shield, is he not? You know, we need to do that because sometimes people in our church and in, in our regular family are at a point where they can't yet defend themselves. Until they know how to fight for themselves and how to stand on the word of God, they need to be what? Protected. Because here's the deal. If a new Christian isn't protected, the devil will destroy them. So many times we let new Christians just walk out of here and not do that. That's why I spend 7 to 10 hours a week on Facebook talking to people because you know what? They need my protection. They need to ask questions. They need that. And you know what happens? But here's the thing about shielding someone. We can also overshield them. That when then we let them go into the world and they get beat up again anyways, even though they've been a Christian maybe three, four years. At some point we have to gently remove the shield a little bit, let them get hit a little so they can learn. Because, you know, we have to go out into the world at some point to reach the sinners, right? I know some people say, well, I never want my, my people, I, I, we're also going to do all Christian things, that's all we're ever going to do. Well, that's great, but here's the deal. If you never meet an unsaved person, how are you going to fulfill the great commission of Jesus Christ? So a good family does that. So how, what's a family look like? It looks like this. There's the kid. There's the dad. This one. And there's the granddad, right? Or daughter, gra mother, grand. But there's three generations. And at some point in your family and in your Christian walk in the church, you're going to be in one of those three spots. Sometimes you might be in two of those spots at the same time. Here's what the kid is. You know, the kid is the person who needs to be learning how to provide for themselves, protect themselves, shield themselves. They should be taking this on, and they need someone to what? Teach them. How can they learn if no one what? Teaches them. And it's not just me. I said, we got to look for others in the church. And remember, a kid doesn't mean just a kid over in children's church. There's some children's, kids in our children's church that are prayer warriors already. They're moving the Holy Spirit already. They could probably teach some of you. But that's a good thing. The next thing is, you have the parent. What's the job of the parent? The parent now is up to the point where they now, they, they, they can provide for themselves. They can fight for themselves. They can shield themselves, hopefully. And at the same time, they are, they are at the age where they're young, and they can also be fighting and shielding and protecting others because they're having kids now, right? And they're out there, and that's their job, to be the active part of the church. And then you have the last one, it's the grandparent. What's the grandparent's job? Well, now they're at the point in life where they've kind of retired to a last of a better term. They don't have to do as much providing, supporting, all that. What they do, they teach the younger ones. And what do they have more than anything else? They have the word experience. This is what I went through in my life. You can make it too because I can help you with that. And the other thing grandparents do is what do they do? They also help the parent out by being that person in the background saying, hey, uh, I, I got you. I'm a support for you. See, all three groups affect each other. And now back, I said all three, and what, and what did the young people do to, to the person teaching them? Makes them feel good too that they're learning, isn't it? They all affect each other. And at some point you will move from stage to stage at different parts of your life. There are people in this room, there are children. There are people in this room who are parent stage. There are people in this room who are grandparent stage and their family and here in church. And your roles might be different in your family and in your church. But we do that because Jesus says that we should, have, we should be more concerned for others than for ourselves. And that's what it's about today. See, our verse today, we're going to include here, the worship team in a few minutes, we want to come up front. It says, this is my commandment, I used this last week, that you love one another as I have loved you. So last week we were supposed to thirst like Jesus did. This week we're supposed to think of others before ourselves, and that's what family does, and that's what Jesus did on the cross. When Jesus hung on that cross... Let me tell you something, when he hang, hanged, hung on that cross, he was going through the worst pain you could ever imagine. He had every right to think of himself first. But yet what did he do? When the thief asked him for help, he offered help. His mother, a widow, needed help. And what did he do? He thought of her above. He could say, oh, mom, how can I help you? Look at my needs. He could say to the thief, yeah, you're dying, I'm dying too. You deal with your own problem. Let me tell you something, folks. If we're a true family, there's no such thing as someone else has their, their own problem. You can't say that because you know what? It's family. If there's a problem in the family, if it affects one individual, it's going to affect everybody. There's no such thing. Oh, that's their problem. That can't exist in a family mindset. We have to hold one another up. Now, here's the key is because, you know, Jesus is on the cross and he's dealing with all this and we're supposed to love like he did, right? 
if you really think about your life and you think really dig down deep, you'll realize that the majority of your life is spent in some type of crisis. Maybe it's not always an overwhelming crisis. It could be you're worrying about something. It could be something with your kids, something with your parents. It could be job-related. It could be relationship. We spend the majority of our lives in crisis, not in peace, if you really, if you really look over your life. We worry a lot more than we're happy. And here's what Jesus says. When we do that, we tend to do what? Think inside, don't we? Well, I can't help anybody else because i got to fix myself first. But Jesus said that on the cross. Here's what he's saying is we need to love like he loved. We're always going to be in crisis mode. We cannot let what affects us affect our duty as a family member and as a human to show love and mercy to other people. And here's what God says when you do that. When you do that, yeah, you still might have problems, but here's the great thing about that is when you become a Christian, who becomes part of your family? Jesus Christ, right? Remember, you're, you're, he's your daddy. And brother, sister, child of God. So that means if you love like he loved, that means Jesus has to love like he says he'll love. And that's your out to your crisis. Because here's what happens when you do that, you look at others, even when you, should, you think you should be looking at yourself, it takes your mind off your problem and allows Jesus Christ to come in and do his thing. And here's what Jesus promises to do. He promises to do this. He promises to provide for you. He promises to fight for you. He promises to be a shield for you. And he promises to give you mercy even when you don't deserve it. But the key is, in order to do him to love you like that, you have to love like he loved. Worship team, come forward, please. You have to do that. Why isn't God fixing my problem? He wants to, and he does that. He says he'll take your worry, he'll take your issues away because if you're loving like he does, he is honor-bound to love you back the same way. Isn't that amazing? I've told so many people over the years, you know what happens? They, they, they dwell with a problem for so long that it eventually beats them up and they leave Christ. I know early in my career, I, I'd be in the ministry. If you go into ministry, you're going to deal with a lot of things. The people business is not a fun business. Pastor Lloyd's laughing. I'm sure Mike has this, would have the same opinion if I asked him in the ministry. Because you get all kinds of people either love, hate you, or somewhere in the middle. And people, some are for you and against you. And, and all these things, and sometimes it changes. And I'd be have a lot of times where I'd be, woe with me, why is this happening? Why is that happening? And I'll tell you when it changed. One of the deepest places in my life I was at. I lost my job in Texas. I didn't have any money for Christmas. Uh, I, I thought my life was ending. The church that I was promised, the, the bishop took it away from me because uh, he said I didn't have enough, it, it, he didn't like the vote or whatever. And I was in a dark place like, Lord, I, I, I did this. I stood up for this church. I, I defended this church, and all I got from it was garbage. And I was really in a bad place for weeks. My wife was upset at me because I was making my kids' Christmas feel terrible, and they were very young at that time. I had friends of mine who would went to me, and they'd tell me how miserable I was. And then my wife signed us up to go to a toy drive and help wrap presents and sort presents for a 1,000 kids. I've done that my whole career. I've always done a Christmas blessing. I wasn't doing one this, this Christmas because I felt, like, terrible. I didn't want to go. Did you know why I didn't want to go? The same reason why you guys say the same, why we all say this. I got too many issues in my life. I don't know how I'm going to provide for my, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, my wife drugged me down there with my two friends. And while I was there, my two friends beat on me. You're the pastor. Why are you talking like that? But you know, it was a good beat down. Because here's what happened. By serving my life changed in that moment of time. My mindset changed while I was serving. That next week, I had people come up to me giving me checks. I never, I didn't know where they came from. I spent the next six months working for a church for free, and I left with double the money in my bank account than I started with, making one-fifth of what I was making before working a temp job. Why? Because then God gave me the, one of my dream jobs. 
And actually, all the whole process led to me being here, which is my dream job. But you know, I had to start helping others, doing the job of a family member in the midst of the crisis. You know what happened? I got out of the crisis because guess what? God could actually do what he needed to do. So today we're going to open the altars. We're going to sing this song. Last week we had a wonderful altar call. Praise the Lord for that. You just got to go backwards to find it. I don't want to we sing. I want you to invite you. If you're here today and you say, I need to be better at focusing on others than myself, you need to come forward. Because that's what it's all about, being Christians. Because you focus on others like Jesus did from the cross, then Jesus focuses more on you and you get more out of your life. I don't know about you, I want more out of my life. I kind of wish I could come to the altar, but, but I'm the pastor, I got to pray. But I'll be here too. Because I always want more. Or maybe you're here today and you're going through a crisis. You want to have that crisis lifted off your shoulder. Well, guess what? Come forward today and let God lift it off of you. As you come forward, say, God, I'm going to do whatever you want me to do to help anybody I, I can. And I remember help doesn't always mean paying for something, doing something. I mean, help can be a lot of different ways. But when we start to put others in front of us, God will fix your problems. Why? Because he wants you to have a great life. And if he doesn't fix your problems, how are you going to testify? You want to unlock the power of God? It's a, this is a doing relationship. This is not just sit there and receive relationship. You've got to do, and then God pours in, and then you receive it. Isn't that great? And you know why we do that? Because that's what Jesus did for us. He did, then he receives us, and then he pours into us. Isn't that great? We follow his example changes. So as we sing this song, come forward and fill the altars today.